next speaker is Steve, who I've come to know very well, from the Walsall Housing Group. And he's head of environment there. And he will talk to us about various things, including, I hope, something mandatory that we should all do. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've been promoted. I'm not really the head of environment at WHC. I'm the Health, Safety and Environmental Manager. And I am delighted to be here for, for various reasons, because 22 years ago, when I first started off in the environmental management field, it was like uh, missionary work for the non-converted. And judging by the amount of people here today, over the last 22 years or so, the message is finally getting through. We've still got a long way to go, as we've already seen, but the message is finally getting there. And I'm also delighted to be here as well, because I, I was project environment manager for Skanska on this project for five years. So I worked here when it was the old hospital. And it's, it's just wonderful to be back here after six or seven years away to, to see it's still looking in pretty good shape. So th thanks very much for having me. And I'm delighted to be part of the, uh, the team. And I'm trying to bring a few of our, uh, of our contacts along as well. I've brought, brought three people with me today I'll, I'll introduce later on. So if we can crack on, can I drive? Yes, Am I allowed to drive? Yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so just to, it, p people who don't know anything about WHG, um, we're a, ha a housing association and we were formed in 2003. And we now own and manage around 20,000 properties in the West Midlands. The majority of the properties are in Warsaw. And it's also interesting as well, going on the other talks that we've had, that <coughs> not only have we got our own operations as a business, we've got 20,000 properties and on the back of that, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that we can influence as well. Uh, the majority of our housing portfolio, portfolio set is in Warsaw, and we operate our own in-house repair team, which is quite unique for housing associations. We actually employ our own repairs team. So we've got about 300 um, operatives that work around the West Midlands, and you'll probably start seeing our vans all around Warsaw now. There's probably over 200 vans floating around Warsaw with WHG on the side, carrying out uh, various activities from home maintenance services to uh, we do a lot of um, estate management as well. So you'll see our vehicles around lots of estates, keeping them clean, tidy and safe. We own three commercial buildings. The biggest one is right next door to Warsaw College at 100 Hatherton Street. And we have two smaller buildings. We have a, a, a place in Leemore, which is the uh, workplace, which I, I was quite interested to hear about how we can make connections with communities because we do a lot of community engagement and courses out there and employability so that's quite an interesting link and we have a, a, an, an older office in Willanall as well right opposite Little so we've got three buildings uh, in this area as well and like I said we're looking at exploring new ways of doing business and serving the community too. I ended up at WHG it's quite interesting really because I, I ended up at WHG in 2012 on the back of working here because one of the um, directors at WHG was on the board of the Warsaw Education Business Partnership and also a um, board member at Warsaw College. And we used to work quite closely with the schools in Warsaw to, on sustainability issues. And I used to set up quite a few exchanges with uh, colleagues, students from WHG coming here and then um, us going back the other way. So it was th this project became quite a catalyst for local engagement. And when I was losing, when I was losing my job, at where I was working at before, I sent my CV out to everybody and WHG invited me in for a chat and said, we've, in our corporate plan, we've, uh, we, we've, we've, we want to get the environmental standard, I said 14,001, are you interested in helping us? And I sort of jumped at the chance because I was about to become a dad as well. So I was looking for a job and close to home. So we're now, six years later, I was <laughs> only there for three months, I've been there for six years, have an environmental policy and we've been accredited as the International Standard for Environmental Management, ISO 14001, which if, if any of you businesses have in, in the room have tried to work, achieve it, it's, it's quite a tough standard to get and it's quite a tough standard to maintain as well. And I'll just take you on a little journey to, through that and how it can possibly complement the work that we're doing at WHG and the other businesses and, how, and some of the small things that we've done as well. So just a quick lesson on ISO 14001, what is it? Operation, it's about identifying activities, products and services that we control and influence that have the potential to interact on the environment either in a negative way or hopefully in a positive way as well. And you can, these are some of the issues that we have to contend with on a daily basis. <coughs> Fly tipping is ripe around WHG's estates. But obviously operationally we use chemicals, materials, 
all kinds of things that are potential. Once they're in use, they can impact on humans. When we dispose of them, they impact on the environment for, through waste or for emissions or for whatever, whatever source. We use a lot of energy as well in our buildings, in our customers' homes, and we, we're always looking at striving at ways to improve energy efficiency, improve maintenance, improve the life cycle of everything that we do. So that's a quick introduction, but what the, the standard requires us to do is identify activities, products and services that have any potential to impact on the environment. And what it does in, means in the day job really is that as a business, legal compliance is not an option. For every business in the whole of the UK, legal compliance is not an option, but the standard sort of puts a, a massive emphasis on legal compliance. But also it has a big influence on continual improvement. And we can't do continual improvement without people's ideas. <coughs> so colleagues' ideas, our suppliers' ideas, you know, business plans, you know, it's all about continual improvement. So <coughs> environmental management is also good business sense. And we're always looking at ways to improve and make savings, improve efficiencies and improve the bottom line. And for, you know, campaigns that we have in our place now, we have, um, you can report an environmental incident off your tablet and your phone. We have some superb waste management, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And in looking at simple campaigns for you know, be acting on people's behaviour, taking ownership of environmental issues. <coughs> so the, the ISO 14001 standard changed in 2015, and it changed in quite an interesting way. And it, this reflects on what we've been talking about, about the global e impacts of plastic and all the other environmental impacts we've been talking about as well. The, ch it ch the standard changed quite significantly and it put in, in place a more sustainable, sustainable look at how businesses manage their environmental issues. And it's been a massive learning journey but also a challenge as well to use ISO 14001 to influence change. When I've been at work to WHG, we have something called a corporate plan. In our corporate plan, it's written by the chief exec and all his team how he's going to change the business, how we're going to do things for a 10-year plan. And we managed to get in there, this strap line, WHG is an environmentally aware business caring about the impact we make. The comms team tried to chuck it out, I chucked it back in again, and it's there, and it's ingrained, and it's part of the values. But we use the 14,001 standard, really, to really influence that, that strap line that's in, in, our, um, in our corporate plan. Now, the 14,001 standard, I've just mentioned about looking at the business's operations, what it controls and influences, but the new standard requires businesses to take a big look at the organisation and its context. So if you look at the hospital in its context, <coughs> it influences all over the place, and so does WHG, because we, we don't just operate, we bring in materials, we develop waste, we use energy, we export energy, we have 20,000 customers, and it's, and it's well, well, how, how do we manage that? How do we, how do we take a look at that? So what we needed to do was identify our environmental responsibilities and we needed to understand the contextual issues around this. So we did quite a big exercise really to look at our internal and external issues that affect the business. Internal issues, I'll talk about them a little External issues, I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. But what positive and negative influence there is and what's relevant to the organisation and its context. So one of the first exercises I did was quite intense. Was I, I just stopped looking at government policy, local policy, housing policy, good practice, and drew a map of how it affected WHG from its organisation and its context. And I'm sure the NHS has got lots of that kind of documentation in it as well. So it, it required us to be a legally compliant business, protect and enhance the environment, and adapt to policy and strategy, and that's the key really, that's the organisation's um, content. So one of the examples I've pulled out there is the West Midlands <coughs> Strate Strategic Transport Plans, and a lot of our vehicles are now impacted on the clean air zones going in, into Birmingham and out of Birmingham, and if the clean air zones come into Warsaw, or into Sandwell, or into Wolverhampton, or half the M6 is captured by it, it has a massive impact on us, so we're looking strategically, not, not two years, three years, five years, ten years, how are these policy uh, changes going to impact on our business? <coughs> we need to be able to adapt to economic uh, conditions, and it's, it's always in the news, isn't it? Economic conditions, whether it's Brexit or global crisis in China, it all has an impact on us because we have to get our materials in place, we need to source them, we need to get them at a good price. 
and, and looking at sustainable development and, con and consumption as well. And we looked at, had a good old look at those. Now, carried out an analysis, don't look at it into too much detail, but as a business, we looked at how, how do all these issues really impact on our operations, not just today, but in the future, because we're also building houses, believe it or not. We're, we're building brand new houses, and the, the company wants to expand from 20,000 houses to 30,000 houses by the year 2024. So all of those conceptual issues impact on WHG. Air emissions, climate change, affordable energy consumption, uh, and production, land resources, water resources. So we've done a risk assessment and, and picked out what are the big, what are the big ones that we can we need to work on. So we defined the context of the organisation and we pick, we picked on these major players. As a business, air quality is massive for us because we operate a fleet of, of vehicles. We also have colleagues who drive around in their own cars. Now anybody who drives around in an old car and has to go into Birmingham we're going to have to pay the, the charge. We've got to think about that as a business. So is there a more sustainable way of getting around? <coughs> Climate change and adaptation. So in, in this, I think it was about March 2018, we had mega floods in, in Warsaw <coughs> and it took out a load of our properties. So these, these incidents aren't just happening once every 100 years. They seem to happen every, every year. And more, and more often, and also the plastic blocks the drains. So the amount of times our guys and the set and Trent guys are pulling plastic out the drains and pulling nappies out the drains and it all backfills into customers' properties. There's a good message that we can use there about the adaptation to climate change. We're look, looking at providing clean and affordable energy to our customers. And then back again, back to where we're here really is responsible consumption and production, because what we've already said, what comes in has to go out again. Uh, looking at responsible use of land, again, <coughs> where are we going to site the properties, what about the properties we've already got, responsible use of water resources, and I'm delighted that you know, South Staff's Water have, have joined us today as well, and we've already done quite a bit of work with them to encourage our customers to use water more efficiently, uh, encourage them to um, you know, we, you know, use water efficiently, and because uh, water has a lot of uses, because you have to heat it, you have to get rid of it, you have to, you know, and we've done schemes with them to put meters in place, uh, put water butts in people's gardens, and ensure that our, all our new properties are meeting the, the best requirements <coughs> for water. It's not always perfect, but we get in there. And then we have to look at the needs of the interested parties as well, because you know, we, we house 20,000 people, plus, well, over 20,000 people, and what are their needs as well? So we've put together a strategy, and it got signed off by our executive just before Christmas, and I've been working on this for two years. So we're trying to make all this stuff mainstream now. And so it, we, we've got our top level objectives and some performance measures around those themes I've just mentioned. So everything that we do, we want to reflect on this as an objective. But I, th I thought I'd just reflect really on you know, the bottom-up stuff that you can do as well and what we've tried to do as an organisation. And we're not perfect in any way. However, you know, we've, we've made a good start. And some of the things that we have done at WHG is we've already removed the, the desks. And, and, and in our offices now, colleagues have to get up and put the stuff in the right bin. We segregate waste uh, across the organisation, whether it's in the offices or operationally. Um, we, we don't have general waste bins, it's recycling bins and we have the one tiny bin for, for any compostable waste like tea bags and sandwiches. We have special waste streams if we have those kind of things as well. One thing I did, first thing I did when I went there was we were spending a fortune on confidential waste. Oh, we were spending a fortune on confidential waste and I was doing audits on the bins and I was finding Argos catalogues and Express and Stars and Builders waste and all sorts and we were paying for the tonne so we locked it all down. And, and we saved a fortune on it, and we only have one collection a month instead of four. Um, take back schemes for, for IT. I got rid of all the paper towels out of the toilets. We use the, the lovely Dyson hand dryers, and so it's less work for the cleaners, <coughs> less waste to clean up. Um, no plastic plates for buffets. We have paper plates, trays, washable mugs, and we've got compost, combustible cups. And, and this is really a message to every business in, in the room, really. Using the correct bins makes sense, financial sense. And we have our waste partners in the room as well, Reconomy, who work quite closely with us at WHG. And 
the landfill tax is nearly £90 a tonne now, so anything you can keep out of that landfill is, is win-win for every business. In the office, like I said, got rid of the paper towels, used the hand dryers, bringing in the reusable, all the buffets we have, for example. We don't want the plastic trays. We have them in paper now. Every, everyone has to get off the chair and put the waste in the bin. No paper bins, and we lock down the confidential waste. We've done quite a lot of other things as well, but every business in the room can do this. You know, it's, it's bottom up, it's good stuff, it, it gets people engaged. So really, we're looking at some, some other message from operations as well. Measure twice, cut once. Uh, take stock, don't over order. We're, all, we're always ordering stuff just in case rather than just, just in time. And we've got our logistics partner and um, source partner with us today as well, Grafton's, who are trying to help us get away from that kind of attitude about Because end of yeah, it's all in the skip it eventually. We want suppliers not to have so much packaging uh, and segregating waste makes sense. Our waste, if we mix it all together, costs us £140 a tonne. If we, if we don't, and we segregate it out, timber, plastics, uh, plasterboards, it costs us about £30 a tonne. So it's a no-brainer for us. And we've got the fantastic performance indicators. Instead of what, it's great to know what we're not sending <coughs> to landfill, but it's also the cost of our waste. And this cost per tonne indicator that's produced through economy is a real sure sign that our waste is getting better and better. We've still got a long way to go, but the cost per tonne is the measure of performance, not how much you send to landfill. It's that, that's, that's the key, because you're getting more efficient, you're not producing as much of it. Training and awareness. Everybody at WHG has to do online training on environmental issues. We do specific training courses as well on waste, environment, spillages, energy management. And we monitor our performance through the ISO 14001 standard. So some examples of our operations, some pro new products that uh, Grafton's have brought in, support we've, we've had with training from Reconomy, training our guys to use the right bins, and it's having a big impact on the waste hierarchy as well. Positive impact. And one thing I challenge every business in, in the room to do as well is look at the true cost of your skips, look in your bins, how much is it costing you, how much material in there that you've over-ordered, how much material in there is it, have you through damage, have a look at what's going in think about where it's come from, get your calculator out and work out the true cost of waste. It'll cost, you'll look at a skip that's cost you £150, cap cost you a thousand. Nearly there. Um, I did actually work for the, uh, I worked at Royal Derby Hospital for quite a while for, for the facilities management company there and one, one of my roles was to engage with the NHS and I've just got some costs of how much the waste used to cost around the, the hospital and <coughs> the clinical waste was top of the pile, 150 pound a ton. Um, but when we used to audit the waste, we used to find everything in its dog in the clinical waste bins, even builder's waste. So just to, you know, if you if you monitor and measure, you can improve. Um, the recycling bins, 19 pound a bag, 19p a bag. The, the mixed up stuff, 42p a bag. This is based on 2011 prices because I haven't worked there for seven years, but just a bit of food for thought for everybody. And really, where can WhatsApp come in? Where can, where can we work together? One thing that I think a lot of businesses are looking to, for support on is to evaluate the environmental performance of products and services. We've already talked about what McDonald's are up to. You know, they're doing very positive stuff in the UK, aren't they now? And having reusable this and reusable that, but every business in the, in the country, <coughs> we're bound by this plastic packaging, we're bound by this equipment that's got, that breaks down after two years. You know, I think collectively, if we can work together and look at the impact of our products and services through our suppliers, you know, we, we can probably start making a difference at, at, at the top end as well as the bottom end. WHG's made a commitment to reduce and actually eliminate uh, packaging and we, are, and we are aspiring to uh, eliminate single-use plastic as well. Again, we need the support of the, the, the organisation that was supplying us as well, and obviously us as clients saying, we don't want any more of this. Um, <coughs> life cycle uh, perspectives as well. It's consistent with the ISO standards, and again, if collaboration really on what we can st stipulate in tender documents, put minimum environmental requirements into our uh, tenders, energy specifications, we don't want this stuff because you send it to us and we have to send it away so any, any of the organisations that want to collaborate to come up with some best practice 
you know, we, I think WhatsApp's a brilliant uh, catalyst for this as well. And, and if we could work together to provide guidelines of how to embed in, into good practice, procurement practice, you know, it would be wonderful. So finally, really, I just wanted to summarise what the challenges and opportunities. I think if, you know, if all the businesses that are here today and the ones that we can reach out to, is to start influencing all businesses, you know, thinking, you know, thinking out for their operations and looking at work and how we can work collaborative together. Um, put life cycle sustainable procurement and obviously businesses can show and tell from each other as well <coughs> and maybe in, develop our own performance indicators you know quantity to emphasize the positive and there's so much positive stuff going on at the bottom end you know that's so you know how, what can we you know get the catalyst for all businesses in, in in this area to improve and even reaching out to our customers and the general public as well and, and look at quantity you know, quality of information as well, the spirit of continual improvement. So we want to be able to walk the talk and we, and we need everybody. So that's my message really, is let's all stay, keep calm, start collaborating and um, if anybody wants to chat I'll, I'll be here till about half past four. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you.